Thank you, Jim. Before I get started, I just want to show how much information is on this button in case you're thinking about getting one. So I'm going to talk about a few of the types from this collection. Every one of these points was taken off of the board and then put together in the button design. So this is a Wabisat type with a contracting stem. That doesn't mean anything right now, but it'll mean a little something more by the end. Um, those date to about 500 BC to about 200 AD. Um, this is a lancelet type point. Um, that's a term that's used, I mean, it just means it's like a large point, like you'd see on a lance. Those are probably, there are a few of those in the collection, probably as old as 5,000 to 500, uh, 5,500 BC. Um, several different kinds of uh, woodland period points um, like these. There are some later types. This collection even has gun flints in it. So it's, it's a very exciting collection for us to have and it's a real mixture of things that, that were on the site um, where uh, Leon Aronson collected these and other children collected them in the past. So I just wanted to point that out. So if you get one of these buttons, you'll be walking around with a piece of very, maybe an image of one of the earliest pieces of New Brighton history. So it, it's, it's well worth your three bucks. Get them while they're hot. Get them while they're hot. <laughs> Give me just a sec, I'm gonna pull the talk and up. $3 was a minimum bid. Okay, <laughs> yeah, we'll take whatever you, you wanna give us, please. We can use every cent. All right. All right. So um, thank you all for coming here tonight. Yeah, I'm a doctor, I'm not a medical doctor, so I can't, I can't give you advice about, about medical conditions, but uh, I've got a degree in anthropology. I've got a, uh, I worked in archeology span for many years. I, like many people in my generation, now I work in software, but, but that was very exciting for me. But um, I grew up a stone's throw away from Long Lake. Um, in the Polynesian Village Apartments. Um, may have a different name today, I'm not sure. Um, but on the other side of 694. And um, when I became an archeologist, I worked around the state, and then later on I did work in Russia, I worked in the North Caucasus, I worked on the Volga River. Um, and um, I really had no idea what an exciting site that we had right here in New Brighton. And, and I'm gonna tell you about that tonight. So thanks very much for joining us. Um, Fred, Fred has mentioned um, how grateful we are for the support that we get from the community and from different organizations in the city. I wanna reiterate that. Um, um, we've gotten very um, generous donations and support from um, the New Brighton Lions Club, the Rotary Club, um, the Eagles Auxiliary, and, and Culver's in the past year. Um, we're grateful for all the support that we get, large and small. So please, anything that you can offer us, um, we're, we're gonna be able to use. Um, if you'd like to help ensure that we're here in 2023 and beyond, if you're not already a member, please join us. Um, you can grab me or Jim or Joyce or Fred or Wayne or any of the other board members that are here tonight and we can get you an application and we would be so happy to have you. They're in the back. They're in the back by the cookies, so don't, don't miss them. You know, grab, grab one of those too. Okay. Okay, so now let's talk about the history of New Brighton and Long Lake in particular. Long Lake is known for its connection with the Minneapolis stockyards, um, ice for ice boxes before refrigeration, and recreation for the city's residents. That's what I've known it for since my family moved here in 1972. But there is a long history of Native Americans living in the New Brighton area uh, before the 1800s when it was settled by European immigrants um, 
Over time, the Dakota lived in fewer and fewer settlements, including Prior Lake and Shakopee, where they remain to this day. But much earlier, around 1740, Dakota people lived in a village near Rice Creek to harvest the wild rice that gives the creek its name. When that village began, or exactly when it was abandoned, are mystery. Native mounds like, like this one, which is actually um, on Long Lake, and I'll be talking about it more tonight, um, containing uh, human remains and a variety of artifacts have been recorded along Rice Creek, and one still stands near where Rice Creek enters Long Lake. And this was mapped back in 1887 and was actually dug into about 15 years before that, and, and I'll be talking about that in the course of the talk tonight, too. But if you want to understand, and, and this Theodore Lewis, he, he was a great uh, cartographer. He went through the whole region. He was in portions of Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, and he in particular mapped ancient remains and burial mounds around the state. What's so important about that is around the turn of the last century, uh, the 20th century, along uh, the Minnesota River Valley in Bloomington, there were probably 300 burial mounds. Today, there are maybe a handful left. And um, in my career back in the 1990s when I was doing survey projects around the area, I mapped a couple of those and checked out their condition. Um, but um, they're not in great shape. Um, the, the one I remember the most was in somebody's backyard and they, they had put a, um, uh, a swing set on top of it in their yard. Um, that's unfortunate. It's private property. I guess they could do that. But um, that's one of the few remaining mounds um, in that area. So Lewis's work is, is very important and was published in, in 1909 and something that I read many years ago. But if you go to burial mounds at Indian Mounds Park in St. Paul, um, there are a few standing today, although they've been altered, they've been preserved, the surface has been changed a little bit to, to preserve and accentuate them. But these are probably 1,500 to 2,000 years old. So these mounds are actually quite early compared to some of the things I'll be talking about tonight, and yet we've got one of those right near that village. That's, that's very intriguing to me. Um, so as I've mentioned, in Minnesota, burial mounds are typically older um, than the village on Long Lake by centuries. Um, however, the Aronson Stone Artifact Collection from the area of the village um, on the north side of Long Lake has arrowheads or dart points that may be thousands of years old, maybe as old as 5500 BC. So um, thanks, Jim, for giving the presentation on um, the, the revamp of the exhibit of this collection. This caught my attention, too, when I became a board member um, about uh, eight years ago and was very exciting for me that we had this. And it's, it's really great that, that Jim has taken the lead in putting this together. And you'll be able to come to the museum this spring and, and see it in person. And you can see all of what is the best evidence that still exists of the early occupation of this area. OK. So according to New Brighton historian Gene Skiba, the people that lived on the north side of Long Lake near the inlet of Rice Creek called their village Atan Wiwakpadan, or village on a stream. The French are said to have called it the Grand Village. The French met the Dakota at Long Lake around 1755 to 1760, where the Dakota remained another 15 to 30 years or the time that the Revolutionary War was ending, so around 1776. 
Earlier, the Dakota had lived further north around Brainerd, Bemidji, and the headwaters of the Mississippi. Conflicts with the Ojibwe led the, the Dakota to move south to the Rum River and St. Croix River, Forest Lake, Bald Eagle Lake, and the chain of lakes, including Long Lake, along Rice Creek. So you, you might be familiar with the chain of lakes um, regional park in Anoka. Um, you, can, you can go and see a lot of um, other lakes that are part of the Rice Creek system there. The French visited the Dakota at the Grand Village on Long Lake during the fur trade. Further conflicts eventually pushed the Dakota south of the Minnesota River. White settlers restricted their movements even more. Wild rice was a critical resource for the Dakota. Until the early 1900s, they moved through the area from Shakopee to their major harvest site at Rice Lake. In the 1830s, uh, the Mittawakanton Dakota settlers on the Minnesota River told explorer and cartographer Joseph Nicollet, who's uh, given his name to the Nicollet Mall in Minneapolis, that their largest village was near Long Lake. In the springtime, they made maple sugar with other Dakota living near Dayton's Bluff. And in the fall, they gathered there to harvest wild rice. One place they're known to have frequented um, is the Gibbs Farm near where the University of Minnesota's um, St. Paul campus now stands, where they traded hides and fish for bread baked by Mrs. Gibbs. Another place they frequented was Lake Johanna. Excuse me, I've got a little squeak in my voice and a little bit of a <clears throat> roughness. I'm just getting over bronchitis, but I'm glad that I got well enough to, to be here tonight. And I've been tested for COVID and I'm, I'm completely free of that. So another place that they frequented was Lake Johanna, where Little Crow is said to have stayed. Uh, little Crow is the chief who led his people in the U.S.-Dakota War in 1862. No major conflicts are recorded here, like that at Battle Creek, where the Chippewa invaded the Dakota village Kaposia in present-day Maplewood in 1842. And Kaposia is where um, uh, Little Crow was born. Although more of the Dakota left Minnesota after the war in 1862, for decades, natives continued to move through the area for wild rice. White settlers' accounts don't tend to stress whether they had Dakota or Ojibwa type tribal affiliations, maybe because of knowledge of this tension that was between them and the history between the two tribes. Um, but we know that there were um, Native Americans in this area in the early 20th century. And if you get Gene Skiba's Green Book, and we've got some here tonight for sale and back, you'll be able to read more about that um, and the village as well. So when he was preparing that Green Book on the history of the area, we call it the Green Book, but it's actually titled The Centennial History of New Brighton, Minnesota. Gene Skiba received a letter from Kenneth Gregson, who said, alongside the lake, was a sand dune during our childhood days where we would go and find any amount of Indian treasures, arrowheads, pipestone pipes, as well as junk early visitors had cast off. These would be uncovered as winds blowing across Long Lake would blow that fickle sand so we would hardly ever miss at finding something. More of Gregson, Gregson's reminiscences are in the Green Book. So um, a lot of the history of the village and the early occupation around that remain a mystery. But there's something really remarkable about children collecting those points. Because at that time, as I'm going to talk about tonight, that village site was probably already um, fairly well destroyed. Sand dunes had been piled up on the north end of the lake. Um, as an early filtration system for water entering the lake. That, that may have went back to the time of the stockyards 
and when the lake was used um, for ice, for ice houses, or for, uh, sorry, ice boxes. Um, so mounds were piled up. There were sand dunes of that sand that was along the lake, and children collected the, the points from there, and, and eventually those dunes were removed. And so the fact that at least we've got one collection from uh, Leon Aronson, who collected there, is just, it's so marvelous for us because we still have evidence of natives in this area thousands of years before the city was even founded, which I think is very exciting for all of us to know. Now let's turn to archeological research, which relies on different, different evidence than history. Artifacts and structures like mounds and other physical remains of sites. So in my career, that's, that's what I primarily did as an anthropologist. I was an archeologist. And one thing you learn in graduate school and in college as an archeologist is, is to be suspicious of history. <laughs> and that's because history is made up of written records, and those records tend to be doctored a bit. They're, they're often skewed to present a particular kind of view of events, um, although they're very important. I'm not denying that, but I'm just giving you the kind of information that was uh, passed on to me when I was a student. So you read the history of someone like Julius Caesar, and you never believe everything he says. He's always going to make himself look better, right? But the thing about artifacts is that in and of themselves, if they're found in the location where they're deposited, they don't lie, right? I mean, we can say it's a fact that somehow this artifact made it here. But then you need a whole lot of artifacts that are preserved in a site very well to tell a really good story about them. Um, even though we don't have the benefit of all that yet today, um, we have enough information, I think, to tell a very important story about early natives in this area. So in October, on October 30th, 1883, the Minneapolis Tribune reported that members of the Minneapolis Academy of Sciences um, excavated a circular mound on Long Lake where they took out portions of 10 human skeletons and a canine jaw, so a wolf or dog. They reported that that mound in its dimensions was about uh, 10 plus feet tall and 85 feet across. On June 1, 1887, Theodore Lewis mapped a circular mound near Rice Creek on the north end of Long Lake. That mound was circular in approximately the dimensions of the mound excavated a few years earlier and must be the same one. Uh, 11 feet tall and 85 feet in diameter. Although Lewis's map was published, the whereabouts of the remains taken from the mound itself are unknown. In the 1930s, the first professional archeologist in Minnesota, University of Minnesota's Lloyd Wilford, is said to have further excavated this mound and dug into Leon Aronson's property just to the west. Unfortunately, no records of this have been found in the Department of Anthropology's files at the university. In the early 1980s, some more work started to happen. And, and I'm proud to say, as a member of the board of the New Brighton Area Historical Society, some of that work was done because of the initiative of the board and the society to go after a grant to fund it. But before that, there were further investigations by archaeologists Scott Anfinson and Bob Klaus from the Minnesota Historical Society. I've known both these gentlemen, both, both retired now. Bob Klaus was the man who gave me my first professional job in archaeology working on the West River Parkway on what's now uh, the Mill Ruins Park in downtown Minneapolis back in 1987, so that, that dates me a ways. Anfinson visited the mound in conjunction with widening the bridge across Rice Creek 
um, on Long Lake Road, which had no impact to the mound. But so he looked at it, he inspected it, but he said, you know, there's not going to be any impact by this project with the bridge, so go ahead with it. In September 1983, Klaus inspected areas where trails and the beach were constructed on the east side of the lake, um, where Joe Hip's farm was, um, now in Long Lake Regional Park. So probably all of you have, have been on those trails at one time or another. He noted remains associated with the stockyards and Hip's farm, but no native sites or artifacts. <coughs> Pardon me, so when you visit the museum this year, you can get a map, um, a, a historical walking map of the trails around the lake, and you can see some of these ruins of the stockyard. So if you haven't had a chance to do that before, it's really fun, I, I highly recommend, it, recommend doing that. A couple years ago, we had a group of Girl Scouts visit us who they wanted to know about the park's history and, and some of the more the less accessible things about it, like archaeological sites, and, and it was a real pleasure to walk them around and, and point out some of those things to them. Around that time, Alan Woolworth, um, who performed the archaeological tests on the property for the New Brighton Area Historical Society in June and July 1984, viewed the Aronson Arrowhead collection, which was not in possession of the museum yet. And he noted point types present as old, in his opinion, as perhaps even 7,000 BC. So I'll, I'll talk about some nuances about that. He made some very general comments about it, and a specialist um, on um, stone artifacts, who's a colleague of mine, um, did some more inspection of that recently, and I'll be talking about that a little later. Um, and he also noted the presence of European gun flints from about 1770 to 1850. The collection itself was uh, sold to the society about, about 10, 12 years ago, as Jim told you. So if, you're, if you come and look at the board, oh yeah, I can get my, you know, my view doesn't look anything like this. It's one of those views you see when you're, you're giving a slideshow, and if you're much more organized than I am, you can put your whole talk on here, and I don't have that. But what I do want to point out is these, these square pieces. These are prismatic gun flints. Some of them are of, of pink flint, and in the opinion of some specialists from the area, they may actually be um, French. So they, they may have come from Europe. Um, so this is part of some of the additional research that we'd like to do on these collections. When it comes to the older kinds of points present, um, this one um, may be perhaps the oldest. Some of these, these longer ones are older types as well. But, but we have a real mixture of things here. And some of the things are not native. And that's because, of course, the French we're at the village, we've got historic reports of that, and also Native Americans were, were using um, flintlock rifles. So um, there's, there's a mixture of technology in there. Woolworth's investigations with members of the society's board, and, and I'd like anybody who was there who volunteered to raise their hand. I knew Joyce was there because I read the report. And, and, well, um, and in fact, we got a group of Irondale High School students. That's right. To do this dig. Yeah. Through uh, the teacher was involved, and there were about yeah. fifteen students that and did it with us. There are a few teachers. One of them was Mr. Greenslit, yeah. I think. Bill and Greenslit. Bill Greenslit. Probably anybody here who was at Irondale then who. <laughs> yeah. I was Irondale at Irondale slightly earlier than that. I did not have the pleasure of being part of that. Um, but also, members of the board at that time included Leon Aronson and Dick Peterson, who owned those properties on the north side of the lake that coincide with the area of the village. So, when 
Woolworth directed this investigation, the first thing they did was they walked over the surface of the park, um, large portions of the park, maybe about 10% of it, um, which was less covered by um, grass, um, bush, things like that. So you could actually see the surface. Um, and they inspected it and found no signs of early native occupation other than the mound itself. They encountered some of the same remains of the stockyards as Klaus, but no native remains. Walkover surveys like this rely on nature to help find ancient remains. Movements of artifacts because of soil processes like ground freeze and thaw, erosion, and critters carrying artifacts to the surface. Full-scale excavation can be expensive and time-consuming, so usually excavation is saved for when something very compelling is encountered and can't be preserved. For instance, today the Minnesota Private Cemeteries Act protects native burial mounds out of respect and because they're sacred to local tribes. And, and that dates from the 1980s. Um, so it would be illegal to disturb the mound on the lake today. However, in other instances, limited test excavations are used to get a view of what's still preserved beneath the surface of, of um, settlement and activity areas that are not funerary in nature. And that's exactly what Woolworth did um, with the rest of the investigators in 1984. He chose four areas around the lake for testing. Um, so here's Long Lake. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to apologize a little bit because I've been under the weather. If I'd had more time, I would put together a, a, a fancier presentation. If we get more research done the way I'm hoping we will in the next year, there'll be a future presentation about this that tells you even more. And then I promise really, really nice slides. But this is a US uh, Geological Survey map of the area, a really good topographic map. Um, and, but these are color, actually. But in old reports like Woolworths, they get reproduced in black and white. And so we see that he tested on the Erickson property over here on the north end um, along one part of Rice Creek here. Um, uh, the mound on the Dick Peterson property um, over in this area, you see Rice Creek going out. Um, over here on the east side of the lake, um, uh, not far from where the beach is today, the big beach, um, there's, there's a large sand dune. You know, there are trails around that. And if you, if you were an inquisitive kid and ever went back in that park before the um, uh, before it was constructed and it was still Hip's farm. Um, there's, at the top, there's a, um, a concrete uh, um, water reservoir. That's right. And, and with a lot of spray paint on it and stuff like that. Um, but so there was testing around that. That looked like a promising area because it sounded like it might be something like the uh, some of the dunes and the sand on the north end of the lake. So that's one of the reasons he chose that. And then he decided to do testing um, in the area of the hip farmhouse itself, um, just to see if there were any remains um, close by there. Now, his testing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through and show you some of this. But he did what, for archaeologists, are, are pretty good-sized test pits. 50 by 50 centimeters, so about a foot and a half um, on each side, to about the same depth um, with the, the dirt screen. And, um, and that's because you know, the sand and the soil that's, that's excavated can hold artifacts that you just can't see with the naked eye. So um, I do another presentation like this. I'll bring you one of my screens, and I'll show you that up here, too. I'll set it up. But, so you, you pass the sand through small uh, mesh screens, and then it captures the artifacts that are left in that soil matrix. And based on where in the ground you were excavating, and all that's mapped all the way down um, during the excavation, 
you can determine at what depth and um, the relative sequence in which things were deposited in that soil and their relative age. You need things like um, artifacts that are datable, like arrowheads, and um, things like radiocarbon dates, if you're lucky enough to get radiocarbon material like, like bone or, or charcoal that are left there that you can get a date like that from. But in, that, in this case, of course, that's not possible. Um, but, but that's what he was up to in his testing. So the first area that I'm going to talk about is this sand dune on Hip's farm. It seemed promising because artifacts were recovered from dunes formerly on the north end of the lake by Aronson and Gregson and other children um, way back when, but nothing was encountered there um, in these excavations except um, modern trash, as you'd expect um, from, from the area of a, of a 20th century farm. Ten test pits were dug in the area of the hip farmhouse in hope that there might be a few small areas of undisturbed soils which could yield artifacts from the former Indian occupation. Um, remains from 20th century farming operations again were found, and besides that, only one nondescript native potsherd and one clay pipe stem. That's enough to show that people had been there in the remote past, but not enough to identify an intact village site um, like we're talking about tonight. Fourteen pits were excavated around the base of the burial mound itself. A number of pieces of early pioneer debris were found, like square nails, pieces of broken dishes and glass, three prehistoric potsherds, some flakes from stone tool manufacture and a quartzite scraper were also found, but no significant amount of village debris. So these artifacts will be curated today at the Minnesota Historical Society. That's where that stuff tends to go. Um, now, a couple things to point out. You saw the earlier map of that mound, it was round. So in the past, um, some driveways were excavated around the edges of it. Um, it's, it's near a garage, and so that, that cut into edges of the mound. Um, this is Dick Peterson himself standing next to the mound, so it doesn't show up real well, but um, you can, you can kind of see it here like that, and you can see a, a structure in the sun in the background, I think, right there. So this would be in 1984. Finally, 25 test pits were made on the Aronson property itself. Um, which at that time was undeveloped and formerly the site of the Langer truck farm. Already disturbed earlier by farming, only a modest number of artifacts was found. Two late middle woodland potsherds, a few stone flakes, and a number of mollusk shells. Again, no significant amount of village debris. It's possible that the village was further inland from these tests and may lie under someone else's modern lawn. It may also have been dredged out in clearing um, the area for stockyards and for farming. The dunes where children collected artifacts um, had been piled up in an earlier effort to filter runoff water entering the lake, as I mentioned. And piling up the dunes may have destroyed significant portions, um, if not all of the village site. And even what was left in the dunes was later lost when those were removed. The artifacts we have now are most of what remains of the native occupations, much of them predating the historic village. And those are only a small surviving fraction of what children actually collected there in the past. So now let's talk about the star of the show tonight, the artifact collection that, that Jim has worked so hard um, with other board members in um, reassembling in a new display that you'll be able to see this spring. A colleague of mine, archaeologist Kent Bakken, looked at a photo of the points in their display frame. Kent is the foremost expert on native stone artifacts in Minnesota 
and has written the guide to the stone used to make them and where they come from in the region. He shared these notes with me, um, which are hopefully just a start to be followed up by a full workup of the collection for a further expansion of the display and publication in the State of Minnesota Archaeology Journal, the Minnesota Archaeologist. So at this point in the talk, I was going to tell you how many pieces are in the collection, but I'm not going to do that. You're going to have to guess, but you'll find out at the end of the talk. Um, but I can say that 80% are projectile points for spears, darts, or arrows. One long hafted point looks like a type called hardened barbed, an early archaic style found mainly in parts of southern Wisconsin and northern Illinois. This type could be roughly dated to perhaps 5500 to 5000 BC. The point may be made of Galena Chert, a raw material found in southeastern Minnesota and nearby parts of Wisconsin, Illinois, and Iowa. So my comments about the points are going to be real general, and I'll be concluding pretty soon. But what I want to stress is that this area of the research is much more time consuming than the excavation itself. There are reference collections at the Minnesota Historical Society and the University of Minnesota, and in the course of doing this kind of research, um, measurements are taken of different diagnostic portions of all the points. They're compared with um, those in the collection, which have dates assigned to them. And um, also, because Kent has spent so many decades studying the raw materials, um, he's got, and the Minnesota Historical Society has, collections of reference material from known sources. So he can say, hey, this is actually derived from um, a deposit of Knife River Flint in, in Wisconsin. Um, this was a, a pretty popular, um, nicely worked material for early natives in the area that was traded very widely around the region. So one of the nice things about that kind of research, besides being able to look at the types and um, compare them closely with these collections and really tell you what's present in the collection more than the observations I can share tonight, you can also take those raw materials and say, wow, that material was being carried that far around this region to get here to Long Lake. Um, in these remote periods in the past. And that's, that's a very exciting part of the story that we can still tell even if the village itself um, is not available for study, unless maybe it's under somebody else's lawn further inland from the lake. Who knows? Because there's no report of its exact location in those um, accounts from the French in the 1700s. So many of the larger uh, to mid-sized spear or dart points are clearly also archaic in age and potentially span the period um, from about 7,500 to, to 2,500 years ago. Both Eastern archaic and Plains archaic styles appear to be present from this cursory observation. So those again would be items like, like these, like this, like this, like this. Some of these, it's, it's hard to say just looking at a photograph or looking at things glued um, on a board. Some of them are possibly also scrapers, and there are scrapers present here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about scrapers in a moment. There are also later woodland period dart points, including the Wabasa contracting stem type. Um, and Wabasa dates from the earlier part of the woodland period. So there's periods in the prehistory before we can ascribe a tribal name um, um, with high confidence um, to Native Americans that lived in the area, although um, mostly in this region remains going back around 2,000 years are in fact attributed to the Dakota. Um, 
But this type, so let's see if I can go back. I, sh I showed it to you on the slide. There's a few of, of these wabisaws on here. There's one up here. Hey, conveniently, it's black, just like the, that uh, schematic diagram. Um, there are a few others on here, too. Um, so that's just kind of a, a rough look at these things. But in, in sitting down and measuring them, um, a much more reliable account can be made of uh, the dating and, again, uh, how far materials traveled um, in assembling this collection. Finally, a number of small notched and unnotched triangular points um, are present. And those date from the end of the woodland period up to historic times, um, maybe even to about the time of the occupation of the village. And they would have mostly been arrow points. So if we go back to the image again, those would be those that just, they look, oh, where's my, there we go. Ah, it's not showing up now. My pointer's not showing up. But there'll be items like, uh, like these small triangular forms, for instance. There's many of those in here. And again, we also have um, several of these um, prismatic gun flints, a uh, couple of them here, there, maybe a, a few others scattered um, across the board. Spend a little time looking at this either at the museum or even ogling it a little bit up here tonight and, and see if you can spot them. Um, biface and scraper technology, so, so biface is a term that's generally used for, for something like a knife that's made out of flint, that's got a blade on either side. Um, there, that technology remains about the same for thousands of years, and it's, it's hard to glean chronological information from that category of artifacts in the same way as from arrowheads. Um, closer examination can, however, sometimes provide insights on manufacturing techniques and on how the pieces may have been used. So again, that's another area of research that we can do on this collection, even though the village itself is missing. You know, we can look at the forms and their relative age, and we can look at raw materials, and we can also look a little bit at how these items were manufactured. The four or five gun flits can be roughly dated between 200 and 300 years ago. And based on raw material color, two of these could be French, although that's tentative. And Bakken says it needs to be checked closely by firsthand examination. So to wrap We'd like to thank you all for joining us here tonight. We'll have a new display available soon at the museum. And with a little luck, we'll have even more to tell you about the Dakota and other Native Americans living near Long Lake in the near future. Thanks.